there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Nelson Mandela was a brave man, patient too. He knew that the darkness must eventually pass, and then would come a new dawn. For decades, South Africa was a stricken country ravaged by racism and fractured by apartheid. Resentment festered amongst her people, and the nation went into isolation. The healing of South Africa was never going to be easy. It continues today in a delicate and difficult process, begun by Nelson Mandela. It was this man who injected his country with the spirit of freedom, tolerance, and justice. And it was this one man who gave hope to the nation and to the world. South Africa's story is largely one of clashing cultures. Early inhabitants were tribal people who farmed crops and herded livestock. They established villages, appointed leaders or kings, and led generally peaceful lives. All that changed in the mid-1600s, when Africa's southern tip became a vital part of the trade routes. The area was soon settled by white people, mainly Dutch as well as German. They called themselves Afrikaners and developed their own hybrid language. Some also brought their own colored slaves whose mixed race descendants were to become the nation's coloreds. In the early 1800s, the British seized control and settlement grew rapidly. There were now two very different white cultures within South Africa. The Afrikaners who were predominantly farmers or Boers in their language and the British settlers who dominated them. The fiercely independent Afrikaners resented the British and grew increasingly nationalistic and conservative. They were also contemptuous of the blacks, seizing their land and enslaving the people. It was their deeply entrenched view that the blacks were an inferior race, a view that held sway for many years in South Africa and drove the nation's politics through much of the 20th century. On July 18, 1918, the Germans limped towards defeat in the First World War. South Africa continued its relentless march down the road to apartheid. And a new baby slipped quietly into the world. It was a humble beginning, born in a hut in the picturesque but poor rural village of Mvezo. The baby's family name was Mandela. His given name, Prohilala, meaning pulling the branch of a tree, 
or troublemaker. The aptly named child had an interesting lineage. His great-grandfather had ruled as king of the Tembu dynasty, and his father, a lesser royal, was tribal chief. The colonial authorities, finding the chief insubordinate, stripped him of his position and much of his property, and the family was forced to move when the Mandela baby was won. Perhaps the father recognized something special in his young son, sending him to the local Methodist missionary school, the first in the family to attend school. It was a very British school, and its principal was blind to any existence of African culture. On Mandela's first day, his teacher gave him the distinctly English name that would stick for life. He became Nelson Mandela. When Mandela was nine, his father died, and he went to live with his uncle, the acting king, who took a consensual approach to rule. The elders told him tales of a brave and noble people, and the young boy was deeply inspired. Completing secondary school and the customary tribal initiation, Mandela began an arts degree at the University College of Fort Hare. Here he met his lifelong friend, Oliver Tambo, with whom he became active in student politics. Both were expelled for joining in a protest boycott. Back home, his stay was brief. His uncle had arranged a marriage for his own son and for Mandela, and neither young man liked the idea. They took off, heading to Johannesburg, where Mandela got work as a policeman in the mines. The experience was a shocking wake-up call for Mandela, who had been relatively sheltered from the cruelty of racism. Now he saw the terrible misery and despair of South Africa's black people. For them, life was a daily grind with not the faintest glimmer of hope. Paid a pittance doing only the worst jobs, they lived and worked in squalor, a cheap labor source for white employers who ruthlessly exploited them. Appalled, Mandela determined to do what he could to bring about change. He completed his arts degree by correspondence and became an articled clerk at a legal firm. He began studying law at the University of Witwatersrand, where he was exposed to radical thinking and a range of black politics. It was here also that he met members of the African National Congress, or ANC, a pro-black rights democracy movement. In 1944, he joined the ANC and entered politics in earnest. The timing was spot on. Treatment of South Africa's blacks had been appalling since whites first landed. But early in the 20th century, there was a fundamental shift as conservatism grew. Now racism ceased to be an individual attitude. It was enshrined in law. Harsh segregation and land legislation ensured it became the status quo. For many blacks, life was a series of indignities. White children had more independence than mature black adults who needed a pass in order to move around. Transport was segregated. So were schools, beaches, even park benches and toilets. Blacks had no voting rights and were shunted out from the cities to rural outposts away from the whites. This forcible removal enabled the minority whites to own over 90% of the land. Not all whites, however, approved of segregation and spoke against it, but to little effect. There were also other differences within the white population. The Afrikaners were proud of their heritage and resented British rule. Many felt a strong allegiance to Germany, and during the Second World War, Nazi sympathizers in South Africa committed acts of sabotage against the Allied war effort. Ironically, some of these later became government members who used treason laws to prosecute peaceful black protesters. The war, if anything, strengthened conservative thought, pushing it into the mainstream. White people, increasingly desensitized to the cruelty around them, were slipping into blind acceptance of an unjust, immoral society. This was the dangerous, murky water into which Nelson Mandela was about to plunge. To date, the ANC had sought change with pretty much a cap-in-hand approach to the government, but always met contempt. Now, with an extreme form of Afrikaner nationalism on the rise, there was no hope of any meaningful dialogue. Nelson Mandela and other young ANC members urged stronger tactics, 
and formed a youth league to take the freedom campaign to the grassroots, the ordinary people who had all but given up. They planned a program of peaceful resistance, demonstrations, boycotts and strikes to initiate desperately needed change. As never before had black rights been quite so wrong. The 1948 election result was a significant win for the conservative cause, as it was chiefly a vote for apartheid. The new premier, Dr. Mallon, was a hardliner, determined to fix the race problem. With this worrisome situation, the ANC turned to its expanding youth league and its dynamic president, Mandela, endorsing its program of action as official ANC policy. By now, Mandela had married Evelyn Masse. At this stage, only two of their four children were born. The three-room house had no power, only an outside toilet, but did have one positive. It was near a gymnasium, where Mandela could pursue his love of boxing, providing some balance to a hectic lifestyle. Then personal tragedy struck, with the death of their young baby girl, only nine months old. Through it all, he pushed on, completing his law degree and working with the ANC to tap into a resource essential to the success of their campaign, South Africa's workers. The workforce was, in truth, a force to be reckoned with. Cities like Johannesburg had grown dramatically in a relatively short time. New industries drew large numbers of white workers, as well as blacks who filled the poverty line jobs on which company profits relied. Trade unions popped up like mushrooms in these fields of shattered dreams. The Communist Party had already harnessed some of this union power and now began its own campaign of strikes. The government cracked down hard, unleashing the police, who indulged in ferocious attacks on the blacks. One stay away saw 18 people killed by police, and Mandela himself was forced to shelter from bullets. Undeterred, the Youth League organized another strike, together with the Indian Congress, a group mentored by Mahatma Gandhi. The strike was well supported, and the two bodies began planning an ongoing defiance of unjust laws campaign. While canvassing support, Mandela was arrested and served a brief imprisonment. The defiance campaign struck a nerve with the exploited workers, and a series of riots broke out. Thousands of arrests were made across the country, and 52 people, including Nelson Mandela, were banned from attending public gatherings. Arrested again soon after, he was one of 20 charged under the sweeping Suppression of Communism Act. They were all found guilty, but as they had consistently preached non-violence to their followers, the sentences were suspended. For the next six months, Mandela was confined to Johannesburg, and during this time began a legal practice with Oliver Tambo, the first black law firm in South Africa. Despite official attempts to shut them down, the pair hung on. Blacks who would otherwise have no representation at law received free or affordable services from the firm, a vital lifeline for those on the slippery slope to unjust imprisonment. The strikes, riots and trials had pushed the black issue to the front pages in South Africa and increasingly overseas. There were many whites who loathed their nation's repressive race laws and protested vigorously, but their voices were easily swept away by the tsunami of conservatism that had built up within South Africa's parliament. The ANC, well aware the government would soon move against it, instructed Mandela to plan a way for the organization to continue as an underground movement. His M plan prepared for a secret network of cells so that leadership could get word of planned protests and stayaways to ordinary people. Mandela was also instrumental in the formation of the multiracial Congress of the People and the development of its Freedom Charter, today considered a model document for human rights. It was now the mid-1950s, and Mandela was heading into rough waters politically and personally. As a Jehovah's Witness, Evelyn could not reconcile politics of any kind with her faith, and her husband's ANC commitments also consumed much of his time, leaving little for family. Finally, it was all too hard, and after ten years of marriage, the couple separated. The government had also clearly had enough of his politics. 
Mandela was one of 156 race leaders arrested and charged with high treason. This was the beginning of the epic treason trial, lasting from 1956 to 1961. Midway through the trial, Mandela married the woman who was to be his great love and ultimately great liability, Nomzamo Winnie Madikizela. The wedding was squeezed in between Mandela's court appearances. The drawn-out trial took up much of Mandela's time as lawyer and defendant, but he managed to keep things going with Winnie by his side. A smart and motivated woman, Winnie was Johannesburg's first black social worker and now turned her considerable abilities to supporting her husband in this demanding time. Later that same year, leadership of the country passed to a tough and uncompromising conservative. Previously Minister for Native Affairs, he had already shown his fierce determination to quell the black rights movement and he was about to further turn the screws. What is our future? And I want to make quite sure that I will not be misunderstood. I am not using this occasion as a platform for putting forward ideas other than those which I hope will help to bring unity, prosperity and happiness to South Africa. The government's solution was to escalate its assault on black dignity. Ruthlessly, it enforced the pass laws, tightening the choker collar on the people to strangle any thoughts of freedom. The malignant pass system was a legacy of the early 18th century, introduced by white South African slave owners to control their male slaves. By the 1950s, the pass, which was really a booklet, included name, tribal affiliation, photograph, permits to travel, work, and be in an area, criminal records, taxation details, and proof of employment to be signed each month by the employer. The pass had to be carried at all times, whether making the long journey to work or just stepping out the front door. Failure to do so resulted in immediate arrest. If the employment record was not signed, the person was deemed unemployed and shuttled off away from home to a native reservation. But now, Favoured's government made its next move, legislating that South Africa's black women must also carry passes. Women feared they'd be separated from their children and dreaded their treatment at the hands of South Africa's brutal police. Quickly, they mobilized to form their own resistance movement. Looking back, Favoured would appear to have been chief architect of South Africa's extremist and legalized system of racism. Certainly there was no one better qualified to sell it to the people, and so he did, with his eerie Orwellian overtones of news speak. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily, and perhaps much better be described, as a policy of good neighborliness. Accepting that there are differences between people, but while these differences exist, and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. On the morning of March 21st, 1960, around 5,000 people gathered for an anti-pass protest outside Sharpville Police Station. Organizers had informed police of the non-violent protest, and officers were able to move amongst the crowd without trouble. It was very much a gathering of ordinary people, grandparents, young men, middle-aged women, children, together as one people, not looking for trouble, but a better way. 
There was a happy mood within the crowd. There'd been talk of an announcement to be made, some good news about passes. The atmosphere was relaxed and festive, the people sharing stories and singing hymns. No one told them to end their singing. No one told them to go away. When low-flying saber jet fighters swooped overhead, the people thought it was a display. When five armored vehicles moved in, they weren't concerned. And when police opened fire, for just a moment, they didn't believe it was real. Then they fled, turning their backs to the police and running for their lives. In around a minute of bedlam, police used machine guns, rifles and revolvers to spray 705 rounds of ammunition. 69 people never made it home from Sharpville. Ten of them were children. Eight were women. Another 180 people were wounded. 50 of these were women and children. All that these people wanted was respect. All they got was the ultimate in disrespect. Most of the dead and wounded were shot in the back. The Sharpville protest had been organized by the Pan-African Congress, or PAC, which was a breakaway group from the ANC. Now it hit back with strike action that lasted for two weeks and involved 95% of the workforce. Angry youths besieged towns and around the country, hordes of people reacted in fury. As expected, the ANC and the PAC were banned outright, and Mandela was once again arrested. The government declared a state of emergency, calling in the armed forces and arresting many thousands of people. The situation was finally under somewhat uneasy control. The Sharpville massacre, as it became known, was certainly one of the defining moments in the struggle for freedom. It provoked outrage across the country, with even conservative press pushing for an end to the past laws. Internationally, it forced the spotlight onto the extremes of South Africa's regime. Not a single country sided with South Africa. And for the first time, the United Nations weighed in on the country's internal politics. South Africa felt increasingly beleaguered. Even the mother country found her dominion to be a wayward, selfish child who didn't play fair. Britain's Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, had already warned the South African government to accept the wind of change the rising nationalism sweeping through the entire African continent. And on the streets of London, the public made their opinions known. Friends of this boycott, is for the people of Britain to register on the widest possible scale their passionate protest against an evil and repulsive doctrine, an evil and repulsive doctrine which says that a man's legal status, a man's political rights, a man's economic opportunities, a man's social position shall depend solely upon the color of his skin. Stubborn and proud, the criticism only strengthened South Africa's resolve. The wind of change took a new turn and the government set a course for deep, unfamiliar waters. Less than 12 months after Sharpville, South Africa became a republic and cut herself adrift from the Commonwealth. Finally, after more than four years, the treason trial was wrapping up. Mandela was one of only 30 still remaining on trial. All were acquitted. Technically a free man, Mandela knew that wouldn't last. The treason trial had featured heavily in foreign media, and he had become a symbol of the anti-apartheid movement, and the ANC was now an illegal organization. He made two major decisions. The first was to go underground. This meant life on the run, forced to live away from Winnie and his family. Not an easy decision. Second, Sharpville had convinced him that peaceful resistance was futile, and now he resolved to take the resistance in a new direction. The Africans require, want the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. They want political independence. Do you see Africans being able to develop in this country without the European being pushed out? We have made it very clear in our policy 
that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. Now, if Dr. Vervoort's government doesn't give you the kind of concessions that you want sometime soon, is there any likelihood of violence? There are many people who feel that uh, the reaction of the government to our stay at home, ordering a general mobilization, arming the white community, arresting 10,000 of Africans, the show of force throughout the country, notwithstanding our clear declaration that this campaign is being run on peaceful and non-violent lines, close the chapter as far as our methods of political struggle are concerned. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. And I think the time has come for us to consider, in the light of our experiences in this stay at home, whether the methods which we have applied so far are adequate. For over a year, Mandela successfully eluded authorities, somehow keeping one step ahead of the government's legion of informers. The Black Pimpernel, as he was dubbed, used a series of disguises to avoid detection. Calling himself David, he passed as a laborer, chef, and as a garden boy. In his main guise, he was a chauffeur, a role enabling him to travel freely around the country, attending meetings and remaining fully involved with ANC activities. He later made a base at Lily's Leaf Farm in Rivonia, where on rare occasions he was able to see Winnie, along with his eldest son, Tembi. During this time, Mandela planned the next stage, an armed struggle. He devised a program of sabotage to take out areas of government infrastructure, particularly those symbolic of apartheid, such as pass offices. Only property was to be targeted. Lives were not to be endangered. The intent was to destabilize the government and undermine international confidence in South Africa, prompting the withdrawal of foreign money. But the ANC was committed to non-violence. It had to be a separate organization. And so Umkonto We Siswe was born, MK for short, meaning Spear of the Nation. Late in 1961, MK began its coordinated campaign of guerrilla warfare. But despite the high ideals, there inevitably was a human toll. Mandela decided to arrange overseas military training for MK's members and was smuggled out of the country. He used the opportunity to gather support for the anti-apartheid movement, meeting with other African and foreign leaders. And in Algeria, he undertook his own military training, the first of many NK freedom fighters to do so. Soon after his return, he was arrested, betrayed by a source believed to be the CIA. Charged with inciting a strike, and leaving the country without a passport, he was sentenced to five years imprisonment. After six months in Pretoria's jail, he was transferred to Robben Island, the prison for black, colored, and Indian people. Robben Island's guards excelled at rubbing a prisoner's nose in the stench that was apartheid. On arrival, Mandela and the other prisoners were ordered to strip naked and issued with khaki prisoner guard. The one Indian in their midst was given long trousers the blacks received shorts, a reminder that they were boys. Two months later, Mandela was back in Pretoria, along with 10 other ANC members. He was charged under the Sabotage Act of 1962. In a departure from innocent until proven guilty, the onus was on the accused to prove their innocence, and the government requested the death sentence. The eight-month-long Rivonia trial was only ever going to be a political trial and one the government could not and would not lose. Internationally, the trial gained huge coverage, and the defendants used the opportunity to speak publicly about the ills of apartheid. It was the words of Nelson Mandela that so memorably captured the spirit of a man and of a people. During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Mandela and seven others were found guilty. 
Their sentence was life imprisonment, not death, probably due to the international attention. But the South African government of the day was an opponent not to be underestimated. When Prime Minister Favord was assassinated, a man with similar uncompromising ideals filled his place. Let me say in conclusion that as far as I'm concerned, when I've said I want to walk the road of Dr. Favord, I also want to walk on that road which impelled him to promote national unity. It will be my aim and object as it was his. I ask, ladies and gentlemen, your support, not for my sake, but for the sake of South Africa, our fatherland. As a political prisoner and a black person, Mandela was in the lowest class of prisoners, receiving the least food and the fewest privileges. Each half year, he was allowed only one visitor and one letter, often so heavily censored that it was almost illegible. By day, he worked in the limestone quarry, breaking up rocks and carrying them from one end of the quarry to the other. In the long hours of relentless heat, the glare of the sun off the white limestone permanently damaged his eyes. At night, he went back to his cramped cell where he confronted the demons of loneliness, doubt, and of sheer time stretching on and on. But he refused to become a victim, using his time to study, doing a law degree by correspondence with London University. In the quarry, as the men broke rocks, they also broke the monotony by teaching one another various subjects, history, languages, politics, whatever knowledge they could share. In 1968, Mandela's mother died of a heart attack. Mandela was refused permission to attend the funeral. Some months later, Winnie was arrested and began an 18-month spell in solitary confinement. Then more bad news. 25-year-old Tembi, Mandela's eldest son, was killed in a car crash. Again, Mandela wasn't allowed to attend the funeral. Even in prison, Mandela remained a problem for the South African government. Later in that same year, a spy for BOSS, South Africa's state agency, infiltrated a plot to rescue him from prison. Mandela's would-be rescuers were unaware that BOSS intended to let Mandela escape so they could shoot him during recapture. British intelligence foiled the plot. Inside prison, the years slowly rolled by. Outside, Winnie was emerging as a leader amongst black women and the government retaliated with a barrage of bans and charges, and there were several attacks on her home and property. She was routinely arrested, leaving the young Mandela girls to fend for themselves. On the streets, the fight continued with strikes, explosions and civil unrest. The 1976 massacre of black school children led to an escalating series of riots in Soweto, which spread around the country. The national mood was ugly and bloodshed and violence were the order of the day, with whites and blacks killed. South Africa was slipping into desperate times. But the world was watching, and Nelson Mandela was not forgotten. It was almost an inverse law that as the days and years passed, so public support grew stronger and the resolve intensified to continue the fight he had begun. The ANC's London-based Oliver Tambo launched a free Nelson Mandela campaign, which quickly captured the public consciousness and zipped around the globe. The groundswell of anti-apartheid feeling that began with Sharpeville and the Mandela trials had now gathered enormous strength and was a force of its own. International sanctions were biting hard, and South Africa was beginning to bleed. In 1982, Mandela and three other senior ANC leaders were transferred to Cape Town's Polesmoor prison. It was a significant move, putting him into closer contact with family and the outside world. In 1985, while hospitalized, he met with Minister for Justice, Kobe Coetzee, a small but important beginning. 
Over the years, the government had made various offers of freedom to Mandela, but they were always conditional, and he refused. When President P.W. Bota made another offer in 1985, his response was, only free men can negotiate. Prisoners cannot enter into contracts. Given the corruption, treachery, and the years of imprisonment endured by Nelson Mandela, it is remarkable and admirable that he did not allow any of this to corrupt his own morality. The freedom he desired was not a ruthless revenge of black people over white people. He detested racism of any kind, and now he envisaged a South Africa of equals, working together to save a country that was spiraling out of control. Years of suffering and frustration had created an increasingly angry and militant mindset amongst the black population, and many districts had become virtually ungovernable. Winnie Mandela was now sparking fear and controversy, surrounding herself with a band of ferocious minders known as the Mandela United Football Club, and implicated in a number of murders. She made violent, bloodthirsty speeches with talk of necklacing, burning people alive using petrol and tires. No more talking, we are now talking about action. We are going to dismantle apartheid physically in this country. The government declared an ongoing state of emergency, imposing curfews, broad censorship and sweeping laws with extreme punishment, including executions. Foreign banks, already nervous, called in their loans. The RAND slid and the pressure rose. Even some of the government's own began questioning apartheid. There's no justification for keeping Mr. Mandela in prison and that the only way in which we can start resolving the problems of our country is in an unconditional release of Mr. Mandela. Recovering from tuberculosis, Mandela was moved to an isolated section of prison where conversations began in earnest with the government. When President Bota suffered a stroke and was forced to resign, F.W. de Klerk took the reins. In a series of preliminary talks, Mandela and de Klerk paved the way for the ANC and the government to sit down together and negotiate. When Parliament opened the following February, de Klerk announced that all political parties were to be unbanned and political prisoners released. It is the combination of the internal and external progressive forces that have forced the government to release us. One gives the impression that uh, Mr. Mandela may be released. The government seems serious. On the 11th of February, 1990, Nelson Mandela walked out of prison after 27 years, free at last. We call on the international community to continue the campaign to isolate the apartheid regime. To live tension now would be to run the risk of aborting the process towards the complete eradication of a party. Our march to freedom is irreversible. We must not allow fear to stand in our way. Life as a free man was a whirlwind. There was much to be done, and there was a frenzy of attention from the media and the public. Mandela had long been absent from public life, and he worked hard to shore up support from his own people and internationally to establish a peaceful and unified South Africa. 
His chief and most difficult task was to engage all the 26 political factions in negotiating a new constitution. Competing with the ANC for a say in this were, of course, de Klerk's National Party, as well as the rival Inkata Freedom Party, a Zulu body led by Chief Butlesi. Also at the table were far-right conservative white groups fiercely opposed to any relaxing of apartheid. The government itself had so far failed to lead by example, keeping its cast-iron grip. There would be no consensus without all sides giving some ground. We will honour every word in this agreement it is our document, and uh, we are therefore going to look very hard and earnestly into the whole question of the armed struggle in the light of this agreement. Real peace for South Africa can only be attained if all the people of <coughs> this country are accommodated in a just and equitable manner. Therefore, those against harmony, or those who are terribly afraid, I think, will be against us. But the overwhelming majority of all the people, whether they black, white, colored, or Indian, will welcome this because this is a step towards a peaceful new South Africa. Politically, it was a rough ride, and Mandela's personal life was also very bumpy. Winnie, who had stood by him all through the years, was a different person from the one he thought he knew. There were terrible allegations against her of fraud, standover tactics, but worse, of kidnapping and murder, and she was brought to trial. Winnie was pulling him down, but Nelson Mandela remained supportive, defending her reputation. As the trial unfolded, however, his loyalty and faith were sorely tested. One of Winnie's many henchmen testified that she ordered him to abduct 14-year-old Stompy Sepe, accused of being a police informer. The boy and three others were taken to Winnie's home, where they were held for days and brutally beaten. Stompy's battered body was found in a field. His throat slit. Although cleared of the murder, Winnie was convicted for the kidnapping and found to be an accessory to assault. She received a six-year jail sentence, which, on appeal, was reduced to a fine. The judge found her guilty. of not reporting the assaults committed by others. I believe that she did not know about such assaults. But loyalty has its bounds. There were irregularities in the handling of the case, the evidence, and in Winnie's testimony. Soon after, Mandela discovered she was having an affair, a relationship she had begun since his release from prison. Their 38-year marriage was over. The process of political negotiations was off and on, as police brutality and government-sanctioned violence continued. The relationship between Mandela and de Klerk was tense and uneasy. There was a mutual distrust and two distinctly different agenda. The only difference, and a very important one, which guides us as an organization, is that he represents the National Party, which is responsible for the suffering which our people uh, have experienced. There has been no changes yet in the policy of that party. The march to freedom was, however, proving more like a wade through mud. The government had not implemented promised changes, and political violence intensified. In the townships, Fierce clashes between Inkata, supported by white police, and the ANC led to further bloodshed. Now blacks were fighting blacks. My message to those of you involved in this battle of brother against brother is this. Take your guns, your knives, and your pandas and throw them into the sea. Anger and frustration on the streets had hardened public attitudes, and the clenched fist was symbolic of more than black rights. Many believed it was the only means of communication and that talk was useless. 
with the assassination by right-wing extremists of the hugely popular leader Chris Haney, the nation was set to erupt into a massive outbreak of violent reprisals. Mandela had a tough job on his hands. His plea for peace was a test of his authority and a powerful sign of his statesmanship. These recent events spurred efforts by both Mandela and de Klerk to push through and finally reach agreement. The two men were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. It was an uneasy partnership of political enemies, and each man fought hard to overcome distrust and differences for the sake of peace. If these two men could find a path to peace, then surely others could also. In 1994, as head of the ANC, Nelson Mandela stood for election to the National Assembly. He also voted for the first time in his life. For the nation's non-whites, the impossible dream had finally come true. For all South Africans, an unforgettable occasion. It is the realization of uh, hopes and dreams that uh, we have cherished over decades. And in that same impossible dream, Nelson Mandela had achieved the unachievable. Now all over the world, there are three words which, spoken together, express the triumph of freedom, democracy, and hope for the future. They are President Nelson Mandela. Hi. Nelson Honestas of Mandela do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. So help me God. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. To that end, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established under the leadership of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It sought to establish the reality of what had occurred, the rights and wrongs on all sides, and to help the nation begin the process of healing. Although many questions remained unanswered, it was an important step in helping all South Africans come to terms with their past. On his 80th birthday, Nelson Mandela did something few 80-year-olds do. I have a very, very short announcement to make today, and a very happy one, that uh, uh, President Nelson Mandela and, and Grasa Michelle got uh, married this afternoon. My wife and I. Mandela's time as president, and indeed after, is distinguished by his statesmanship and his quest for peace. He shored up international relations for South Africa and mediated in difficult situations. At home, the spirit of the people rose, many for the first time in their lives feeling optimistic for the future. The Nobel Prize was one of many acknowledgements Mandela received for his contributions as a great diplomat, rights campaigner, and pacifist. After one term as president, Mandela retired from politics, devoting himself to family life and to supporting various causes, including the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Make Poverty History, numerous children's charities and human rights campaigns. He also set up 4664, the AIDS fundraising campaign, named after his prison number and a cause particularly close to his heart. In 2004, at the age of 85, he scaled back his commitments due to health reasons. Though he didn't rule out future involvements, he made it clear he wanted some space. Don't call me, I'll call you. And call he did, 
continuing to tackle some of the world's toughest problems. A true champion of freedom and the human spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, There's one regret I've had throughout my life. That I never became the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. <laughs> and we thank you, Mr. President, for being the person we'd all like to be on our best day. In 2008, an old, frail-looking man stood on a stage. But it was not just a stage. This man stood on the world stage. And the world looked on and applauded him and genuinely wished him well. It had been a long, tumultuous journey for this man, all the way from the simple hut in the Transky 90 years earlier. And it had been a long and lonely struggle to find a path through the fog of prejudice and suspicion through the murk of corruption and greed. But he made it through. And in so doing, this one man changed his own life and the lives of his countrymen and those of millions, even billions of people around the world. This one man, Nelson Mandela, bestowed a precious gift. He showed us all that even in our darkest moment, there is still hope and we must never give up.